January 17, 1991. A massive air campaign against Iraq is underway by forces from the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, France, Saudi Arabia, and Italy. Coalition missiles, fighters, and strike aircraft fill the skies of Iraq. In response to this, Saddam Hussein, the Prime Minister of Iraq at the time, orders several Scud missiles to be launched against Israel, impacting in Tel Aviv and Haifa. Buildings are destroyed and lives ruined. This prompted Israel to plan an attack on Iraq, but the United States was opposed to this idea. In order to entice Israel to not launch their own attack, something had to be done about these missiles. The SS-1 Scud, this thing. It's the NATO reporting name for the R-11 and R-17 Soviet-built tactical ballistic missile. And Iraq had a bunch of them, including their own custom-made ones, like the feared Al-Hussein used in the Iran-Iraq war. And transporting these was the Soviet-built Maz-543 Transporter Erector Launcher, or TELS, or Iraq's own custom-made TELS. The problem with these for the Coalition was that these were mobile and camouflaged well. They could pop up at anywhere, at any time. Shoot and scoot. In order to find these, the US Air Force rushed the E-8 Joint Stars ground surveillance aircraft into service and used it to see a substantial distance into Iraq while in safe, friendly airspace. And in order to destroy these Scuds, US commanders devised a role for strike aircraft, Scud Cap or Scud Combat Air Patrol. Attacking aircraft will be in a narrowed down area of where suspected Scud launches could originate. For daytime attacks, the A-10s would eyeball out or use their AGM-65 Maverick missiles to help them acquire targets. But for nighttime, the F-15E Strike Eagle was called upon. It uses its powerful Pratt & Whitney engines to help power its APG-70 radar with air-to-ground search capability well respected by its pilots and WIZOs for amazing clarity. Giving the Strike Eagle its night strike capability was the AN-AAQ-14 Lantern Flare Targeting Pod and AN-AAQ-13 Lantern Flare Navigation Pod. The nav pod would relay an image from its flare camera to the pilot's heads-up display an amazing tool for low-level night attacks. And the targeting pod was used for acquisition and battle damage assessment of a target from medium altitude. It was also laser capable to guide laser guided bombs on target. The F-15Es would patrol with an assortment of weapons, like the Mark 82 and Mark 84 general purpose munition, both able to give 500 and 2,000 pounds of hate respectively and they can be turned into laser-guided munitions with special kits, giving them the name GBU-12 and GBU-10, respectively, and was also armed with the more controversial cluster munitions like the Mark 20 and CBU-87 munitions dispenser. For self-defense against enemy aircraft, they carry the short-range AIM-9 Lima and or Mike Sidewinder, but on some occasions, they would mix their loads on their conformal fuel tanks with two medium-ranged AIM-7 Sparrows. And if all else failed, it had its 20mm M61 Vulcan cannon. While armed with some of these weapons, they would patrol in their designated search areas called Scud Boxes. Along with them, many miles away in friendly airspace, was the E-8 J-Stars, sweeping for possible mobile Scud launchers moving on the ground but it had a problem. It couldn't distinguish between an actual mobile Scud launcher and some random truck, but it would have a better chance of detecting them if they were fully erect, so to speak. If one was detected, the J-STARS crew would relay this information to an E-3 airborne warning and control system, and that E-3 would then pass this information on to the patrolling Strike Eagles. The Strike Eagles would then use their powerful APG-70 radar to sweep the ground for moving targets, near the given coordinates from miles away. See these pluses on the screen? Each one is a possible contact on the ground. Or create a very detailed map of a possible non-mobile fixed scud site. 
If they managed to find something, they would use their targeting pod for visual confirmation at medium altitude. A better aid for the Strike Eagle crew would be if the launcher was, again, fully erect, so to speak. But if they were not, they were very tough to find. Another great way to tell is if the missile was launched and the pilots would seek them out immediately. But of the 42 occasions a launch was witnessed by the crew, there were only 8 cases of weapons employed against scuds. The pilots never had to see a launch though. If a satellite was overhead, it would detect a launch. This information would then be passed on to the Air Force Command Center in Saudi Arabia, then to an EAJ STARS, to an AWACS, then to the Strike Eagles. Once confirmed, it's bombs away. Now the Iraqi operators launching these weapons weren't idiots. They knew they were going to be destroyed soon, so they had to move. This was estimated as 30 minutes, but in reality, they could do it in just 6 minutes. Not only that, they were well camouflaged. The Iraqi military adopted the Soviet strategy of maskerovka, or masking. Essentially confusing, frustrating, and deceiving your enemy. And it worked really well. So well that military planners didn't expect so many decoys. They even employed inflatable scud decoys. If a strike equal didn't have laser guided weapons, they would deploy their munitions at a safe altitude sometimes. But if it was an uneventful patrol, they would drop their munitions on secondary pre-planned targets. Such as known fixed scud sites. These patrols would last for hours for the patrolling crew, from night to dawn, but they were always relieved by another flight. To extend their time in the night, they would fly to the nearest tanker and refuel. The lantern flare targeting pod they carried was limited in number, with some units being rushed into service for the war. Because of this, it was often given to the element leader in a flight of four. That would be the third jet in a group. Allegedly, the targeting pod's quality wasn't the best at a very high altitude. Let's just say things that looked like scud launchers, they were not scud launchers. From random trucks, to houses, to even a passenger bus. Even trucks with large fuel tanks possess scud-like features when observed from these pods. Even with precise coordinates, the scuds were still hard to find with the lanterns. The Strike Eagle's friend wasn't just the Joint Stars. Special forces on the ground would also lend a hand as well, being inserted behind enemy lines. Just because the fixed scud sites weren't moving, they were not easy targets. They were well defended with anti-aircraft artillery and rolling SAM systems. Some pilots attacking these sites overjeed their aircraft to avoid getting hit by anti-aircraft artillery. And on one occasion, a Strike Eagle attacking one of these sites was almost taken out by a Roland. While no F-15C variant was shot down during the conflict, the Strike Eagle attributed to the loss of two aircraft and two crew. One being shot down by anti-aircraft artillery attacking a heavily defended petrol, oil, and lubricant station, killing pilot Major Thomas Koritz and weapon system officer Major Donnie R. Holland, and another being shot down while attacking a fixed scud site by an SA-2 guideline, but both pilots would eject but then taken as POWs until the end of the war. Across the board, these scud hunting missions were largely unsuccessful, attributed to the fact that Iraqi missile production was targeted but never made a dent. As for the scud launchers, many known fixed scud sites were destroyed, but Iraqi intelligence was informed by a mole to move their missiles to their mobile scud units, so these fixed scud sites were measly a distraction. Even though many mobile scud kills were discredited after the end of the war, 80% of laser guided bombs dropped and the Strike Eagle claimed to have hit their target. But what even was their target if they couldn't truly identify it on their screens at a somewhat safe altitude? It could have been a passenger bus and allegedly on an occasion it unfortunately was. Even herds of animals would look like mobile scud launchers to the crew through their screens. Or those mobile scud launchers could have been inflatable decoys. The lessons learned from the Great Scud Hunt of Desert Storm could be applied to a possible conflict with North Korea, as they maintain a far greater arsenal of mobile missile launchers. 